And then the last part of it is um, we want to inter, uh, we want to involve the international uh, stakeholders in the international conference for sharing our ideas with people from the UN, from AU, from regionals, uh, from the regions, IGAD, and let them come. We'll show them what we have done, and then we have video clips, we have infographs, we have all sorts of materials that we have generated. We'll be working with radio presenters, uh, TV presenters, and so many mechanisms uh, by which we, we use through social media. And that is April, 20, June, April to June 2019. Then we have the end line, which is the, the end of this research, between July to September. So by, by September, we expect that this, uh, September 2019, we expect that we will have actually completed this research. So it's a very ambitious research for three years. And of course, as you can see, uh, I've taken a lot of your time and those who have been attentive, attentive that means I've gone with you for three years in this discussion. And um, we are PISNET and IGAT C1. And I think that is the end of my presentation. Um, two other resources that you have, the background paper, the concept note, and my own speech, my own presentation here. So I expect you to, um, in the end, come up with where help us to review this and help me to guide this research work to the end. And only hold Trophina, anytime we want to move this issue forward, we want to accomplish it. And uh, if the objective does not fit into your thinking, take it out, replace it with something. I want youth to be very vigilant. I've seen the representation of youth. If I go by my definition, up to 35, whether you have a child or not, you are married or not, if you are below 35, you are still a youth in the African context. So thank you so much for listening, and thank you once again. Um, I hope in the next three days, some of you who will be with me here, we will come with a very, very roadmap because of this inception. We are stepping into something that all of us need to do it together. So thank you very much. The operational definition that is already given on extremism, just to ask, is it wrong to have extremist ideas or ideologies? Because it is about challenging certain social norms, uh, having in mind that we have social political dynamism world over, and we have things like democracy, gender equality urbanization and emerging trends, also in fashion. Uh, some may be seen as extremists because they challenge uh, the social norms that people believe in. I want to go also in uh, religious ideology. Within the Catholic, uh, we had extremists from our definition, people like uh, Oscar Romero, the South American uh, Catholic who advocated for liberation theology. We had uh, the issue of Nation of Islam, Elijah Muhammad, and uh, through that process, if it was, if there were extreme ideas, some are negative. So it's attached or next to the question that I asked, are all extreme ideas negative? Then that may lead us to question the government response. Is it response to thwart the emergence of extreme ideas or the response to thwart violent extremism? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Sande, for that elaborate presentation. Uh, mine goes to the issue of partnership and ownership of the process from the word go. I happen to have been in Djibouti.
Kuti when the IGAD Center for Excellence uh, in terms of the countering violent extremism uh, strategic document was, was validated by the member countries. I was on the, the Uganda delegation. There was a lot of hype around this research. But today, to see that you know, none of the key power brokers in the center, and also the eager Siwa, is not here, I begin to have some cold feet. What is the strategy that we are going to you know, constantly have them back, the buy-in? Because I don't see Moses here, I don't see Dr. Yet they had a lot of um, excitement around being here, or even either hope uh, or the team. Simon. Yes, because this space is very critical for their buy-in and also for their understanding and, and, and support. My name is Dennis Wasikatu. Uh, I'm from the County Governance Watch. Uh, thank you, Prof, for that presentation. Uh, one, I'll begin with the first conclusion that you made that uh, not all extremist, uh, not all extremist, viol not all extreme violence uh, leads to terrorists. And to me, I think we should, in my opinion, uh, yes, not all extremists are terrorists, but not all violent extremists are terrorists. Because once you conduct the aspect of violence, then definitely that it turns into uh, terrorism, in my opinion. Then again, uh, aside from that, uh, uh, this discussion is important because even as an organization, we also run a CV program. And we've actually done a research on, uh, on countering uh, violent extremism among youth and anti radicalization. Uh, last year, in September, we did hold a national conference on CV and anti radicalization, uh, which brought together uh, youth from universities and students of higher learning. We actually converged in CIA. Uh, University, we had uh, 1,897 from across the country. And so uh, most of the counties that you're also uh, speaking to are actually some that were also invited uh, to the workshop, and I think it will be important that we uh, build in in terms of uh, uh, as well sharing that report with you so that can also be a basis uh, once we also begin interventions. Then again, we've also been dealing with counties, and uh, one of the issues that uh, Professor mentioned, which is on it, well, even with what we also found out. But of course, most of the causes of extreme violence, uh, especially among youth, uh, goes of course with the, the context and the different counties, uh, like you did mention. Uh, those that are close to uh, Somalia would naturally have the aspect of religious extremism. Uh, we have those uh, like Risa, uh, again, uh, which also bring the aspect of uh, marginalization. Uh, but then again, we also have a new uh, aspect where we're also having uh, violent extremists. The youth also participate in the terrorism, but coming from outside uh, those circles, which I think again it was good that you also mentioned that aspect of the sumo, because also we are having uh, this idea of radicalization among youth, not necessarily as a result of religious extremism nor marginalization, uh, but also those that are buying in from other communities, in way, uh, if I may use that, or other regions. And so we had uh, quite an interest in CIA and just understanding uh, in these universities, bringing together all these youth, what are the issues that uh, lead them into this. And so we provided that platform where these youth can also share uh, some of the challenges that, uh, that they go through in their respective universities across the country. And I think it was quite an eye-opener. And it would be interesting that uh, we can share that uh, research with you, Prof. and uh, Dr. Trufen, and so that jointly we can see how best we can approach this issue of intervention and extremism. Thank you. The definition of extremism and is about so I want to raise the controversy. I think, as uh, my friend there said, um, in conflict resolution, we must, uh, there is this concept that uh, not every conflict is uh, bad, you can tr actually transform. And so, um, how do we then marry these two? Because you talk about extreme, uh, you know, uh, you know. Um, uh, extremism, and so this is the controversy we need to be able to shed light on. But the other one is about your suggested seven-point uh, area areas to take action. Again, another controversy. Uh, and uh, I want to 
uh, specifically refer to number one, uh, the strategy number one, which is dialogue. Um, and I guess when you were explaining, you talk about this is an international, uh, you know, proposal to dialogue with people with extreme, you know, ideas. Um, in Kenya, uh, we have we have had this controversy right now arising from the challenge Kenya has been facing in Somalia. And it's about, you know, people have been providing these solutions and ideas about negotiating and dialoguing with Al-Shabaab. <laughs> so the question is, how, how, how feasible is this solution uh, to actually dialogue with people like that? Where do you find them in the first place? Where are they? And so, for me, it's a controversy, and maybe um, we need to be able to discuss on a plenary. Maybe we may not have answers to this, but it's something that we can all discuss and agree on how feasible uh, dialoguing as an approach to solving these problems. Government officials to give me uh, key areas that they think I can actually focus this research on. We talked with uh, Tufena in, in these areas and also with PeaceNet and with, uh, with Lena. And the government have given me some clue in Uganda at least, some clue where to go and confirmed. Even when we were looking for research permit, you have to clearly state where this research is going to take place. And they approve that. So at least I can say that uh, we have a, a research permit for Uganda. We have a research permit for, uh, for Kenya as well. So let us come back and then we exhaust quite a number of these issues that we are talking about. So many tools have been missed out, for example. Um, internet, um, clips, videos, films, um, texts, sharing texts and gatherings. Some people were even suggesting that go where they are selling drugs. You know, be part of the drug selling uh, community because this is where they also exist. Go where there's prostitution. Go where there's, you know, all throughout. So we are looking at the bottom of thing, male and female, both in this together. BU 16, 17, 18, 35 and below. So if you are 36 and you still want to become 35, you can uh, you can hide your birth certificate and we can still talk to you. So, okay, uh, thank you so much. Um, I have not answered you particularly explicitly, but I think there are people who will also answer you in terms of specific questions in my team. I, I think I must say that as the National Steering Committee on Peace and Conflict Management Secretariat, we feel very honored to be part of this process. This very second meeting that uh, we have been invited to by BISNET. Uh, one, we also appreciate the partnerships that have been brought on the table to basically discuss the work that lies ahead for all of us. I think uh, we cannot uh, afford to just do a single file kind of approach. We need multiplicity of actors. And therefore, for me, this praise that I've come to the table would be useful shaping the research that we want to get involved in, also the rest of the work that will, will come with this. Um, and, and therefore, as an N the NSC Secretariat, we want to commit ourselves to this process. On behalf of my boss, Peter Fuku, I want to commit that we'll be able to work with BizNet on this and ensure that we reach out to the rest of the ministry, colleagues and partners out there to be able to support this process. Issues of CBE, uh, and I'm told you also need to talk about PCBE, preventing as well as countering, are not issues that can be handled by one individual entity and therefore the need for us to actually work together. And you can also not, not, not you can't, we can't do these issues without involving the security agencies, meaning that we will see how we also look, I mean, bring on board the security agencies uh, through the Office of the National uh, Police Service. Um, I was expecting that probably they are represented in this meeting, maybe they are not. Yeah, uh, but I'm, I understand they send apologies. But above all, um, we cannot do this business without involving the National Counterterrorism Center, NCTC. They are very crucial. I'm aware they also send the apologies. I think they are still consulting and they also have quite a bit to handle. Uh, just indicating that we need to see how we, we create these partnerships with, with most of these partners, especially in the state. Uh, real to see how we can all move together. And therefore, on this note, let me not belabor so much, uh, but I'm, 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 I'm looking at the concept paper already, or the background paper, 
and I'm looking at the areas of, of, of engagement, areas of, you know, uh, where we'll be doing the research. And I'm, 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 I would really uh, put it on the table that even as we talk about focusing on other areas, we may also reconsider putting in Nairobi. Uh, I think there's a lot that people do, and the perception is radicalization, extremism, violence, whatever, is at the coast, it's in Northeastern, it's in Busia, and we forget about Nairobi. Uh, we may rethink. Let's be, try to be flexible in a way, so that we also see some elements uh, that we can grasp from the Nairobi city county. Because I believe it's a very fertile ground, there's very, uh, very rich experience that we can get from Nairobi that can also inform our research. So, in the course of our, our study, let's see whether we can uh, we can also infuse Nairobi City County as one of our flagship counties for this research. Uh, therefore, on that note, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Lord, let me note it's an afternoon and, and I, I, I run the risk of not doing it very well, but I want to thank you all and I'm here for discussion. Thank you. Our question was, what kind of recommendations might be forwarded to improve CVE practice and policy, interventions, gender dynamics? As a group, uh, we looked at the policies first, and um, some, of the some of the recommendations are actually very clear in terms of uh, the policies that we have. Uh, the first policy that we, that address, that actually captures clearly is um, implementation mechanisms, both in terms of prevention and countering violent extremism. Uh, the other uh, policy that we have, uh, in fact, uh, that has been uh, ratified internationally is uh, UN Security Council Resolution 2250, which addresses the issues of youth participation in security and peace building activities. That one is very clear, and uh, I think we can borrow a leaf from that in terms of implementation. Um, the other one is uh, Women, Peace, Security Agenda in both countries, especially in Uganda and in Kenya, and also looking at Security Council Resolution 1325 and also SDGs 5, uh, 516 actually addresses the issues of uh, women involvement in peace and security agenda. Um, the other uh, recommendation is uh, consolidating the efforts gained in both countries. Uh, we are lucky in Kenya we have um, 
uh, uh, countering uh, the, this, the national strategy in, co uh, in countering extreme violence. We have the Secretariat, but in Uganda there is uh, no such institution. So there is a, a, a very good uh, l lesson to be learned in terms of consolidating the efforts of both countries. Um, the other one is um, the Youth Employment Desk. In Kenya we have so many youth uh, empowerment uh, 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 pr uh, programs, especially the Youth Enterprise Development Fund, we have the WESA Fund, uh, there is a Women uh, Enterprise Fund. So if you look at all these policies, uh, sometimes you talk about the reason why young people are joining um, uh, militia groups, because they are unemployed. But looking at the, uh, the, the current statistics that we have, not every, uh, every young person can be employed. Some can employ themselves. And the best way to do it is actually uh, going for these uh, uh, capital startups, capital to, to, to start business uh, for themselves. Uh, the other uh, thing that we looked at is mapping of uh, uh, CVE and PVE at the national and regional level and analysis. Mapping has never been done. So there is need for mapping to be done um, uh, so that um, even, even at, the, at, at the regional level and, then at the, at the, and also at the, the local level. Um, the other uh, issue we looked at is integration of returnees. When young people who have been recruited to join Al-Shabaab and after they come back, how does the community uh, perceive them? Are they welcome back? or they are being pushed at the far corner. So that's also another issue. Returnees, um, uh, the, the rehabilitation of uh, returnees. Um, another hot uh, issue that um, came up is um, one of the recommendations of social media regulation. How can we regulate social media? A lot of young people are being recruited to join uh, violent extremism through social media. And that is a fact. Uh, how can we regulate? As a, uh, the states, uh, the, uh, the, how can states regulate social media? Um, our good friends from Uganda and Ethiopia can actually give us very good uh, lessons <laughs> from that. <laughs> so do we shut down Facebook and Twitter and WhatsApp? So how do we go about it? Um, the other one is uh, devolving of the policy on CVE. Um, I just uh, knew that there was a, a policy on uh, countering uh, violent extremism at the national level uh, being done by uh, NSC. Uh, that policy, the contents of that policy, implementation of that policy, even if it's going to be passed, how is it going to be implemented? That is also another issue. Uh, in terms of practices, uh, recommendation for practices is um, implementation of the Center for Employment Bill, especially focusing on the conference that, that was uh, done at the Great Lakes region. Uh, I understand it's only Kenya that has actually set up um, Youth Employment Bill under the office of the president. Uh, the rest of the Great Lakes countries have not done so. So, um, the other one is um, uh, consolidating efforts of creating the um, uh, CVE uh, strategies in both countries also needs to be done in terms of practices. Uh, in Kenya, we have uh, the Center for um, uh, strategy for counter countering violent extremism, and in U in Uganda uh, there is no such institution. So, in terms of uh, practices, that is also a good avenue. Um, we also address the issues of youth spaces. Um, youth spaces, especially in our communities, where do young people go after school? A young person spends eight hours in class. After school, do we know where these young people go? Right now, if you look in our communities, there is a lot of gambling uh, places, 
what is the spirit, pool tables, there is no football field, there is no basketball field where young people can go and uh, do extracurricular activities simply because the spaces are not there. Or either, even if it's there, it has been grabbed by politicians. So, in terms of practices, it's, uh, creating safe space for young people in our communities. Um, youth identity. The identity of young people in terms of, um, in, if you look at families, uh, a parenting role, very clearly, you'll find that most parents, um, a 10 year old boy will be given responsibility to go and look for food for the family if the father is not there. So in terms of parenting role, a 10 year old is still very young. So responsibilities, bestowing responsibility on them is actually giving them so much that they can handle. That's the reason why you find most of 10 year old right now feel they are more uh, they are actually men enough to stand out there. That's why they are even, you find in every chaos they are at the forefront. See, when I was 10 years old, actually, I, the only thing I could do is uh, run to my mom. But right now you find in, in this generation, 10 year old, 9 year old know so much more than you. Because even, even the generational change, a lot of things have, are changing. So parenting role is also very, very uh, crucial. Um, the, other, the other practice, um, the other recommendation is actually strengthening the relationship between the state agencies and organizations dealing with CBE. We all know uh, dealing with state agencies is not easy. Sometimes, uh, there, there, there are things that they are supposed to take the lead role, but you'll find uh, you are the one who are actually following them to, to, to come and attend to your forums. Um, one of the uh, examples is uh, in Kenya we have uh, inter-religious inter council. They were doing a TV advert on um, uh, radicalization. Uh, the, 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 the challenge is most of these TV adverts, and most of these decisions are made, no young people are involved. Because uh, mo most of the interreligious council, uh, I don't think interreligious council has any youth representation on, 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 on their forum. Because most of them are actually uh, uh, retired uh, elders, uh, most of them are actually that they're not youth friendly. So let me just put the term youth friendly out there. So youth involvement in uh, security issues. If something is being done, how are young people involved? Um, and then uh, question five, what are the issues that the country assessment studies uh, have not addressed? Uh, as a group, I, we thought that is a very open question. Because first of all, there are so I, I, uh, I believe there are so many assessments that have been done either previously by other institutions on CVE, um, and most of these uh, assessments that have been done, uh, most of them actually the results are actually the same. We we know because uh, the the results of this assessment mostly is young people are perpetrators and victims of CVE. So in recommendation, what needs to be done? Youth empowerment. We all know uh, youth empowerment programs that needs to be um, uh, set up. Uh, the other one is the stigmatization of young people. In most of these assessments, even if they were there and they have been done, you'll find uh, it's not only young people who are actually involved in uh, CVE. Even older people are. But at the end of the day, the end result is pointing that the, the last person to to, to actually uh, being criticized is a young person. So stigmatization of young people has also uh, been at the high, at, at, an, at, at actually at a high level. So th those are some of the issues that needs to be addressed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next group. Very brief. Uh, 
what are the key problems or contradictions in the police legal frameworks governing CBE? The first problem is that the the policy the policy is not very much known by the stakeholders uh, working on CBE. Um, another thing is uh, CBE has been put under the National Cultural Center, which is entirely a state-led intervention. So the role of civil society is very limited, if not near. If at all they do in Kenya, then it has to get a nod from the Tourism Center, which at times they are not very friendly. Um, then another thing is uh, what lags in the policy framework is the reintegration process for the returnees or people who have been uh, uh, radicalized because since it's driven by the state, there is lack of trust that will you be uh, revictimized or uh, is it true reintegration? So there are no frameworks for reintegration or even uh, structures because we have in the criminal justice and or uh, we can talk of the restorative, restorative justice system, there are probation officers that take people through this process, but we do not have the same to guide the integration process of these people. Then we have uh, what lacks in the in the framework is uh, accountability strategy by the state officers who respond uh, to terrorism. And there's lack of harmonization of the, ju the justice system. That's why there is recurrence of uh, extradition killings we have witnessed in Kenya because they are not held accountable for violation of human rights. So the police is silent on that. How do we achieve justice and how do we counter? The, the, the violence. Then, I think something that is so loud, I think we have had that discussion since we came in the morning. Like, what is violent extremism? Is it only leaning towards religion? If it is really leaning towards the religion only, and the other spaces are not open so that you can vent out to look at it holistically, then we put uh, the Islamic religion like the public domain stigmatized as the offenders of the of the violence. So the policy framework, even how we have coined our our research problems and also gone our target areas, it leads towards religion. But we said in the morning that uh, violent extremism is a uh, a white thing, not only religion. So it lags. So it really narrows down to religion, which also contributes to stigmatization. Um, then another thing that uh, we said uh, the limited, because of the uh, securitization, we call it securitization of uh, violent extremism. Some people may not be willing to work with government because of the injustices uh, that the government does. So, even support to make uh, deterrence efforts are limited for the, some donors. So, it is an effect of the same. Then, the number Number five, what are the issues that the country assessment studies have not addressed? I think we have, like my colleague said, we have done a lot of research, we have a lot of research findings on CBE, but in terms of trying to advocate to 
for the implementation of the findings. It has not been easy. So if there will be an effort after research, then there is lobbying and advocacy for the implementation of the same, I will put in the national strategy. It will be a good thing. How has implementation of youth, gender, and crime prevention policies by governments affected CB? Okay. Uh, at first, we discussed some options, tried to ascertain the nature of the question. Then we came up with uh, some answers. Uh, first answer was uh, the effects of policies by government, for example, here in Kenya, we have chosen, uh, well, the government has chosen to create a youth procurement process, meaning that 30% of all tenders would be given directly to youth. They would have uh, like first dibs, or how do you say, the, they would be considered up to 30% of tenders given to them. Yet this was unfortunate because a lot of these tenders, which should be given to the youth, uh, they still are frustrated in the process because they don't have the, the resources. Imagine youth trying to get tenders worth 10 to 30 million. Uh, you know, they're all well intended yet, they're hard to get, and in other words, government doesn't have like small tenders. Uh, that was a problem. And uh, the youth uh, are also thwarted by corruption, uh, processes are unfair, and then they're forced to seek other means, uh, limiting the efforts of uh, CBE. Again, we discussed that employment, when the youth go seeking employment, but the opportunities are hard to come by because you cannot get employed with no experience. It's, it's very hard. I mean, not everybody gets into volunteer opportunities or internships. So a lot of the youth end up taking other routes to try and put something in their pocket. So it always, again, counters the effects of CBE. So it's not always uh, friendly towards youth. Em employment opportunities are not always friendly towards the youth. Education. Uh, in secondary education here in Kenya is free. So it, it tends to pull a majority of people, a, a wide number, who might otherwise be, maybe be drawn into to joining CD at that, uh, sorry, violent extremism at an earlier age. They say, get drawn into education, and they learn to think for themselves, and those certain ideologies don't affect them, radicalization doesn't grip them as quickly, so they, their, you know, their spirits are lifted and they have more hope of building a future. So initially it seems good, but yet again they, they can slip out of this process and you still find educated people, like those people who, was it they attacked uh, Garissa University or uh, one of the other places, one of them was like doing law, you know, and he's educated. So you expect that some people aren't easily, easily radicalized yet, it's, it still happens despite the level of education. Um, again, school dropouts. There are large numbers also at high school if you don't necessarily get the grades. You know, the systems require a certain level of education for you to proceed. That can be difficult. So, um, youth can seek, uh, excuse me. Um, so there's no clear path towards uh, some means of earning uh, a living or making money. Even if you, you finish your university, it's no guarantee that you're going to get a job after that. And because the government did make these uh, changes early on to try and draw people in, I think the effects are also seen in Uganda as well as in Kenya that uh, the, the, the universities can get people an education, yet it doesn't necessarily mean you're guaranteed a job once you finish. So it's not as an assumption. There's still that assumption that people think a good education means a good job at the end, yet it doesn't always prove the point, and uh, it affects the CV. There's also political ideologies. 
uh, skewed and then people get forced out into the fringes and they end up uh, being joining uh, violent extremism. Uh, for example, in Uganda, the student bodies are actually uh, tailored by political parties. They fund student bodies. So if somebody's running for president of a student body in a St. Macara University, he ends up uh, being uh, streamlined into the political uh, process and he becomes like a tool for political parties. And that, and also like if there are riots in from or difficulties from Macquarie University, you know it had to have something to do with one of the political parties in Uganda. So again, you know, like the gender rule in Uganda, uh, in reference to the UN resolutions 13, 1325, uh, requiring women, female participation within politics. So like, a, like, sort of like Ken Kenya's two-thirds gender rule. But all of these uh, tend to have a problem because even trying to get people through disability, yet when they get there, they have to go through a very rigorous or difficult nomination process, which means that you don't see them uh, the right people that are wanted by the grassroots level don't always get the seats. So you get a lot of despondent reactions and people sort of lose hope in the political process. And that spins off into potential for violent extremism. Um, another thing that we discussed was uh, community policing. So you get a reaction that the youth can become more violent, they change tactics, they, even though they, they shift uh, positions and the hard to trace and things like this, just because the, the government has tried to, say, infiltrate through uh, sort of non-violent, uh, uh, impartial means, but they have to be identified like the uniforms, like in Uganda, for example. But then what they do is that they now create a, a system where the youth live out of the law, they they live in the fringes, they become like, uh, again, that extremist element. And this is, uh, they become lawless. And then you get, uh, say, women, the gender rule. Okay, I have to finish up. Uh, you get put into women, like get pregnant, you know, in the teens, they share drugs, they have a problem, you know, threatening cops with needles. They become hopeless. The hopelessness and desperation increases. And we just discuss a bit of question five, like uh, just to grab what are the issues, or what are the issues that the country assessment studies have not addressed. So we touched on how do you tell a youth is prone to violent extremism, and uh, out of uh, like coming out of school, how does the curriculum in schools? Uh, the curriculum review in schools uh, give the youth a knowledge, a knowledge base that they can apply. So if they're out of school, how do they avoid joining fantasy streams on their own just from the knowledge they've gained at school? Thank you. Good, fine. And, uh, our question was, how does the def definitional ambiguity of youth and violence complicate the research practice and policy of addressing the phenomenon. And the first thing we said was that uh, different people would uh, develop policies depending on how they define and perceive the youth as being and also what they understand according to them would be extremist violence. Uh, different people in, from different backgrounds and uh, maybe countries and uh, cultures would differently uh, uh, they tend to define what violence is to them, what extremism is to them, and what uh, the youth can be, as we had seen in uh, the uh, presentation this morning. Uh, another thing was that uh, the government and constitutional definition in different countries also poses a challenge uh, in defining who the youth are. 
for example, in uh, Kenya, we have a different uh, definition of who a youth is based on their age, say from 18 to 35, though some other people say 34 years and nine months. That is, yeah. Before you reach it, if I, yeah, 35, when we are 35, we are now uh, a longer youth. Uh, the available li literature also focuses on the youth as being the violent ones, but may be funded and perpetuated by older people, 35 and above. This is mostly seen in a political scene, where you see, for example, right now in Kenya, campaigns are going on, people are going for nominations, then and thereafter, the engineering period, they tend to fund and use the youth uh, more than uh, the older people. Uh, another one is uh, youths are being perceived as instruments for violence, as they are, uh, there are those ones that are called youth for hire. The same uh, thing that happens, especially in the political scene. Uh, cultural structures in some communities push the youth, especially the young men, to cattle racing, racing, for example, in search of wealth for dowry in terms of cattle when they want to get married. So you find that uh, it's not by choice, they have to do it because it's been always done culturally from where they come from. Okay. It is also important for this research to come up with a concise concise operational definitions of the forms of extremism and how to counter them. Okay. Then there was also the power, the issue of power and relations between countries and also this also comes into play because when locals kill each other, uh, it's business as usual, but when a foreigner is killed, the government steps in and it's seen as a big issue. For example, you remember that the reason why Kenya or the Amazon right now is facing, fighting the Al Shabaab is because of some two foreigners who are killed in Lamo. Then the government decided to go into Somalia and fight the Al Shabaab. Also, recently in Nigeria, uh, a ranger was killed He's from uh, Britain, British descent. And that is when the government also went in, stepped in, and uh, trying to find a solution, but when people were killing each other locally before, no one was talking about it. The way Africans perceive their story is different from what other people from outside Africa would define it. We define it and perceive uh, the situations here. It's also a big issue and it's a challenge. There was an issue of propaganda because mostly the youth will fight based on propaganda and what may not actually be on the ground, but what they hear uh, from. For an example is uh, the Arab Spring that uh, was was uh, spread on uh, the social media. They, and we are aware that uh, most of the users or, or the consumers on the internet and social media are youth. So they tend to actually take up from there without even going to look at what is actually true. Uh, for number five, the question was, what are the issues that the country assessment studies have not addressed? We say that uh, they have taken for granted the role played by the mass media on communication and mediation. And then there was uh, the issue of gender. When a woman is a victim, it's always perceived not to be violent. Thank you. I'll be very brief. I think the advantage is being the last thing that uh, some of the points that we're going to, 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 to push across have been addressed by three. Uh, one, uh, the government directive on uh, criminals and people that might have been engaged in uh, terrorism to come kill. Amnesty. Uh, in some areas, some cases have been had where the police still go ahead and target these uh, reformed youth 
and uh, this leads to the disappearance of some of those youth. So this makes uh, the rest hide or, or go under or not actually. Number two, youth enterprising funds. That one somebody also mentioned. In some counties that might be considered not government friendly, the youth are finding it really hard to obtain some of these funds. And this acts as a motivating factor to join some of the the, 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 the groups, the terrorist groups or criminal gangs. Uh, another one is, uh, okay, this is not really on policies, but uh, the plans for closure of the refugee camp in the adult. It was noted that some youths disappeared, and even some got a way of getting to the neighbor in Somalia. Um, Go to number five. What are the issues that county assessment studies are not addressed? Uh, we felt that uh, the issue of the radicalization has not really been talked about. There is much on the, what what to the push and pull factors. The fact that the youths are the ones uh, perpetrating uh, the perpetrating uh, <laughs> that the ones involved in violence. But not so much as we talk about the radicalization and their integration back into the community and how to do that. And uh, another thing, uh, the likelihood, the likelihood of, uh, that some extremist groups might might have started on an ideological footing, sort of like. Uh, sort of, they were initially a, a, just a group. We were given an example of the monkey kids, that initially they were, theirs was just a cultural ideology. But then over the years, things have changed, and finally uh, some groups become violent. So we were wondering whether that has also been considered in some of those assessments. OK, I think that will be all. Thank you. Thank you so much. In this theory of change, we are, I, would, I wish um, Mr. Makoti would be here because I, we really need him. In this particular case, the government should tell us if we are on the right path. In the theory of change, uh, we, are, we are looking at the roadmap to achieving our goal. Where we are today, we are starting, the foundation of this is our objectives. This could change, and they will change. With your, with what, with your inputs, they are going to change. First, we want to make them smart objectives, which are uh, measurable and timely depending on our context. Uh, we want to look at the analysis of factors that predispose youth to engage in violent extremism. Uh, the gender strategies of creating and deepening interventions for countering violent extremism. What has been done and is it gender sensitive? Has it been gendered? Uh, the gender policies and practices geared to countering violent extremism, giving youth a voice. Now, you realize that the two look alike, but they are not. Uh, when you look at our infographic, it has three objectives. I broke, I broke uh, one of them where we were, we were looking 